How do those triggers feel, man? Well, right now they're pretty flimsy because there's no power running to them. There's no this thing. This thing is inert. Does it push back? It's 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 a null sense right now. It's not sensing anything. Yes, they totally do. Like, is it does it push hard enough that you could not physically squeeze in on that thing? Um, I don't know. Well, it definitely has not done that. Like okay. They, they, none of the tech demos or like game scenarios that I've encountered have been tuned in that way. I don't know what the actual maximum force is on these things. You don't need, they don't give you like a Newton number. It's not oh, like this man. is 68 Newtons. This thing should just come with a, like a proper like profiling utility that just lets oh. you adjust the tension and play with it yourself and like mess around. But that's not, that would not be a very Sony like thing to do, but uh, does, does, is that just on the triggers or is it on the sticks too? The actual resistance, the actual pushback. Yeah. It's just the, just the uh, triggers. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. The haptics on this thing are great, but they are haptics, you know, like you, you've, if you have an iPhone or I presume most Androids th- these days have quite good uh, haptics in them. So like that's, it's impressive, but not something you haven't seen before. But this trigger thing is literally like I yelped out loud. <laughs> I, 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 I emitted an involuntary exclamation <laughs> the first time I tried one of these. Tri- I mean, they, well, I'm limited in what I can say right now, but the, let's, let's say they go out of their way to present you some pretty extreme cases right up front. Do the Xbox controllers have the same, the trigger rumble that they had last I time? I believe like, it is the same. Yeah. Which is so, like, it's not, it's not insubstantial, but it's not like this. I wonder if this is going to give them feature parity now. So we see, cause it feels like that trigger rumble on the Xbox one was something that like Forza used. And I don't remember seeing it anywhere else. I don't, but I don't think those things can exert actual tension can they they can't it just but it did feel like like the the canonical example of where i saw that was like when you were doing like a drift in and you need to kind of feather the gas and the brake in a racing game and you kind of feel a little bit of a like you'd feel something it felt like something was happening there was no pushback though right i mean these things are essentially capable of locking themselves like i've talked about on some of the giant bomb content so far but you know you know the elite controller you know how it's got that feature where you can yeah you can reduce the throw or the the kind of the size of the arc of the triggers to next to nothing for like call of duty you know games where you need to hit the trigger very quickly and they, they do that physically or mechanically by shoving a piece of plastic in the way of the trigger yeah these these can replicate that exact same action but just with whatever thing is going on in there that makes the triggers resistive or maybe resistive is not the right word to use because that's also an electrical term right but 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 like it's you you're feeling it feels like the spring that holds the trigger back is stronger it's yeah. it literally they can wherever i think wherever they want in the arc of this trigger they can just make it like stop i mean and you can push your way through it you can force your way through it but there's like a there's a literal almost like snap and release feel of like pushing through the tension and then it kind of pops that you know it's the yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the gamecube controller is the canonical example here you oh, know, it, the, well because it had a detent right the gamecube controller what's that it had a detent where you pull like part way and then there's a second yes, step and it like stops on a and then it's kind of trigger or something kinda, yeah kind of clicks at the end like they can yeah. replicate that exact feel except mechan- like mechanically with whatever they're do you have any idea what tech is behind that it's just haptic feedback stuff. I don't know what I don't know how they're doing it. I'm I can't wait to see the teardown. This like of all of the new cons, console stuff, the PS5 controller is the thing I am most interested totally. in. I, I in no world did I expect to be saying that the controller is the most interesting thing about these con- either of these consoles so far. But it it totally is. At the same time, there is zero chance I will ever take this thing apart. Oh no, you will because the battery will die eventually, and you'll well, have to. I mean, okay, five six years from now, it will no longer be fancy and and fun and new and shiny, and then maybe fine. But as well, of right it, now working a spudger into the seam on this thing feels like it would probably break something. So I'm Wait, are not there gonna... not any, are there not screw holes on the back? Usually Ooh, there's screw holes on the no, back. No, there are not. <gasps> oh no, they're there are, harder to open. There are no exposed screws that I can see on this thing. So, uh, get your spudgers ready. <laughs> Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Hello. I also really like that it has the, the PS logo buttons on like in the grain to make it grippy. Oh, I that's I, really cool. I think my eyes are not good enough to I can't see that. It just looks like a gritty, sandy kind of texture. Did, I guess did, you need like a magnifying glass to see that. I guess the other the only other question I had is like the launch PS4 DualShocks felt kind of 
uh, like rickety is not the right word, but they're creaky. This yes. one, does this Creaky, feel solid flimsy. like the second gen yes, ones? Yes, absolutely. Hang on. Okay. Let me open this drawer. Brad's opening a drawer. Fish out one of my DualShock 4s, which I have way too many of. Oh, um, yeah, me too. This is even one of the more recent ones. It's got the light bar across the touchpad. Those ones are, I think those are They're better. Like, They're, I really like those. Yeah. You're, you're not wrong. They're definitely better. They still could get to the point after a lot of use where they're a little bit like basically if you grip the two kind of handles on the DualShock 4 and sort of twist gently. Yeah, you can feel it feels just like a you little, can snap it. It feels like there's a little bit of creak in the seams of the housing, right? You yeah. can just sort of like very gently flex it. This thing has none of that. That's good. Like, it feels like a brick. It I want to. Like, yeah, I want to feel like I could chuck that through a plate glass window and there'd be nothing wrong with it. It is really, really just sturdy and firm and like things built like a tank, man. It feels pretty good. Uh, I'm excited. They're shipping. I've been I I saw a word going around this week that they were shipping. And then sure enough, like on a couple of gaming forums today, I saw people posting photos of like, hey, my dual sense arrived. Hmm. So I guess it's possible to buy them somewhere now. I, I didn't order a PS5 and I kind of like. Yeah, this is the first time in 10 years, probably 15 years that I haven't like signed up for just launch consoles. Not, not just there day one. Yeah, and I, I kind of didn't care, but now I'm, I am I have controller envy. Ah, uh, yes, the FOMO is real in all situations, but. Uh, I mean, realistically, all I'd play is Miles Morales because I'm going to play Bug Snacks on the PC and yes. like, you know, anyway. Uh, Miles Morales play, uh, plays on the PS4. All right, yeah, that's also not true. With, not with ray tracing. No, I like uh, ray tracing a lot. It turns out um, I do, too. Uh, I real quick before I forget, I just gonna throw this out there. Episode idea that just came to me. Yeah. If maybe go through the litany of console hardware failures we have had over the <laughs> course of our lives. Oh, because I, I don't want to get on, on a big tangent here. But if I were not in this line of work, I am like the the furthest from the have to be there on day one early adopter. Yeah, didn't you never buy a Wii? I did. Yeah, I never owned a Wii. Uh, <laughs> but. I went, I actually did a mental inventory the other day and I can't think of a single console I have ever bought on day one in my so entire I, life, except for the I, Nintendo 6. I take it back. Nintendo 64 is the only one I can think of. I bought a Wii on day one, but that's only because Gina was like driving by the GameStop in Colma one day and saw a bunch of people lined up outside and was like, hey, what are you guys in line for? As she was going to the FedEx office, she was like, oh, this is the Wii pre-order line. And she got the last one for wow. the Colma GameStop. So we had a Wii and that was that was exciting because those were things were hard to find for like six or eight months. Well, that was an um, investment. Like if you decided you didn't like the Wii, you could still flip it for <laughs> like easily more than you paid for it. Oh, yeah. And then the Xbox 360, I got real close to launch like i bought it from ebay because i was so hyped about geometry wars and then i put like 100 hours into geometry wars, geometry wars is a very good game a very good game uh, but like i i just i was so burned the uh playstation and playstation 2 generations by console hardware failures that i have never early adopted again yeah my my ps4 i bought a ps4 for tested for us to take apart at launch and that one is still going strong okay all right um and my xbox ones i like all my the only the only consoles i think i've ever had well anyway with, with the, this yeah, is a good we'll, episode we'll, idea. we'll get into it yeah. sometime but yeah like i yeah well yes um, um, but but uh today uh we started talking about this ages ago yes uh, i have spent a lot of time over the last couple of months finally moving everything over from a closed proprietary smart home system called smart things that samsung owns now over to the open equivalent or one of the open equivalents called home assistant yes it's been a journey uh, yeah i'm sure I, so i also just last weekend Ooh. have have started following in your footsteps um so I thought it'd be fun to talk about it, but uh, I'm trying to look up here because if uh, if you haven't listened to all of the episodes of the show, first of all, why not? Second well, I mean, of all, <laughs> listen, I, don't, I don't expect everybody to love everything that we do. I'm, just, yeah, I'm yeah. just kidding. Second of all, I'm, I'm looking for it here. We did. Uh, so we did a home automation episode. Gosh, last fall. It was it was early, but it was, it was kind of, of about hardware and stuff not well, like yeah, it was more it was, it was kind of a primer it was basically like an intro to home yeah. automation and sort of like here are some of the major platforms and standards but we didn't get too deep into any one of those things um so, so, so should, should, we, should we talk about our paths to home assistant like why did you want to get on to yeah, I, so um, a couple of things happened earlier this year. One is that Wink, which is one of the other. So most home automation systems you set up, you have a bunch of devices that are from a bunch of different manufacturers. Yes. And then there's like one hub 
that kind of corrals all of them and knows how to speak to all of those. And the goal when you're buying the hub is to get the one that talks to all of the stuff that you have and all the stuff that you might want to have in the future. And then um, it like provides the services you need. So it, what you right. want to, if you want to use like voice assistance, you want to connect to Alexa and Google Home is and there, Siri and all of that stuff. Is, is there one hub in the commercial space that actually does that, that can talk to every single one of them? That seems impossible because there are so many standards and networks to account for. So smart things has really wide adoption. Like, they, okay. they connect to a ton of stuff over API. They have partnerships with Google and Amazon and all that stuff. So your Alexa and your Google Assistant and all that stuff work. They don't work super well with Apple stuff because they yeah. didn't jump into the home kit for uh, the the you know the home kit hardware for a um, but there are solutions for that like the home kit bridge thing uh, which will basically let you set up a, a, a it's like a it's like a translation layer between right. home kit and smart things yeah um, it's why I went with them. But they just killed their Gen 1 API stuff, their first Rev API stuff, and forced everybody to roll over to Samsung accounts. And because of a comedy of errors uh, that basically involved me taking over, somebody signed up for a Samsung account with my email address. And rather than kill that account, I, I it doesn't matter. It, the upshot is my Samsung account was irrevocably tied to India. And the <laughs> Home Assistant, the smart thing stuff has... Uh, um, uh, FCC type regulations. So if you're in the wrong region on your Samsung account, certain things won't work because they are in, they use radio bands that are not available in the regions that you're signed up for. That's a lot to deal with. Yeah. So I was going to have to reset up the whole thing from scratch. Just, and I just, was like, just to schedule your lights to come on at a certain time. Well, I mean, look, it was, I made a mistake, but also Samsung didn't help me fix the mistake. So, sure. um, it, the, the, the big takeaway is that if I was going to have to go back and reset up all of this stuff, I wanted something that was more capable than yes. what I could do with smart and, things and, and more generalized, right? Just more, more universal for all the different Open. brands. Yes. Yeah. So something I'm, that I could hack my own shit into if I wanted totally, to. Totally. Totally. So yeah. I'm, I'm in a pretty similar boat, except that we were all Apple home here for better or worse, mm. mostly for worse. Um, first of all, like you, you referred to the home kit hardware situation as a fray, which yes. I think, <laughs> I think is pretty apt. Um, it's a it's a weird scene where like a ton of devices just don't have support for it at all. My understanding is that Apple's security requirements to be branded as HomeKit compatible are pretty onerous. Is that they, right? They, there is a hardware requirement which right. it, which adds actual cost and people like in the in the spaces that a lot of this stuff operates. If you say, "Hey, we have a ten cent chip we want you to add on," they're going to give you the finger and hit the door. Totally. So, like in yeah. a lot of a lot of device categories, we just could not find what we wanted that was compatible with HomeKit in the first place. The stuff that we do have. Uh, I found it to be super unresponsive. Like it would just go dead off and on where I would have to like, I have to pull the dresser out or like fish under the bed and pull the smart plug out and plug it back in to restart it because in the home app, it just said not responding and like could never figure out any rhyme or reason to that stuff. Do you, do you have an Apple T, a current gen Apple TV no, that works as the home so, kit hub? So, so no. So this was, this is a kind of tertiary consequence of this whole thing, but it is another nice thing about moving to home assistant. I was using my iPad pro as the hub. Oh, right. Okay. And as I uh, will get to this, but as I have gotten on to home assistant and stopped using that iPad as a home hub, the battery life has like quintupled. Oh yeah, I'm sure. It is insane. Like that thing would, that thing would drain half its battery in like 24 hours just sitting around before. And now it's like 95% after, <laughs> after a day. Well, um, so the bad news is you still are probably going to use something as a home hub. Although I guess. Well, you so there, use, there are solutions in home yeah. system for that, which yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll get to. And then the other thing, not to just sit here and complain about Apple home all the time, but we got hit by the super widespread bug where I could not invite my girlfriend to my home no matter what we did. Like there's some weird loop on the Apple like server end where oh, weird. you send an invite and they accept it on their end and it looks like they're in, but it just says invite pending on your end for months at a time. <laughs> and like Reddit is full of people with the same problem and you have to like call Apple and play the customer service rep roulette or uh, situation where like, if they know what you're talking about, they'll escalate you to engineering and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Well, so, so also the other thing that happened this spring is that wink just said, which was the other big, like open third party came in and were like, yeah, if you guys want to keep using our service, you got to pay five bucks a month. <laughs> So were they open source before they were, or were they always closed source, but free. So you oh, bought really? a piece of hardware and then like it, uh, Phillips tried to do the same thing with their early Hue hubs. They, they killed off all their early Hue hubs and they didn't try to charge, but they said, Hey, you need to buy a new hub. If you want to keep using your, your $80 light bulbs. 
Um, so, so like, there's a lot going on in that space as things are consolidating. Um, Google has killed two hubs, I think, now that they've purchased, f- like, for IP purchases, it seems like, or for team purchases. But yeah, didn't and, wasn't there some big thing with Nest shutting down a major service not so, a, so a Nest week or two ago? Closed up a lot of their APIs so that. Like you, like just anybody can't get an API key and then have full right access to your house. The thing that they did is a good thing. They just kind of handled it poorly, as in in a true Google fashion. Sure. Um. But but yeah. So I looked at the different other things that were out there. We talked about them a little bit in that last episode. And one of the big pieces of feedback that we got was that people really like Home Assistant from that yeah. from that first home home automation episode. It, it seems like it seems like the most active community from what I've seen. Like there's what what are the others? That you know, there's there's Open Hab seems like the other big the, one. That Open Hab is the other biggish one, but like. Yeah. In terms of wide hardware, like what I was looking for, honestly, were wide hardware support and good documentation. And Home Assistant had that in all of the things that I had hardware yeah. for. Yeah. Um. And and like it's it is really apparent that they spend that somebody there is spending a lot of time taking forum posts and turning them into actionable <laughs> documentation. True. They have very good guides on all kinds of stuff. I can I yeah. can attest to that. Yeah. It's 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 um it's it's really well done. Um, I went through a whole path trying to get it set up and running. We don't need to go through all that necessarily, but I tried putting it in a free NAS jail. Same. Um, it was, since it's designed to run on Linux, I got it mostly working, but yes. then like it wouldn't connect to HomeKit devices or my Lutron certificate getter app wouldn't work or, or whatever. Like there were 50 different things that failed in weird ways. And finally I was just like, fuck it. I'm going to buy a, a $30 raspberry yep. Pi yes. and, and put it on that. Cause my time is worth more than making this work I, on the thing that honestly, I'm probably going to get rid of and change over to something else sometime in the, in the next 12 months. I feel, I feel like my time with free NAS slash true NAS is growing ever shorter. Look, I love my Plex server and and the the ecosystem around that, but I have no, absolutely no uh, loyalty to FreeNAS at this point. Anyway, yeah. different topic for another yes. day. Yes. So um, you're, on, you're on a Pi 3? Is so I right? put it on a Pi. I tried a Pi 1 because I had one laying around. That wasn't, that wasn't going to, that yeah. dog would not hunt. Yes. Um, the Pi, Raspberry Pi, Pi 3 yeah. Rev B that I got was fine. They recommend a 4. I think you're fine with a 3. It seems like the upgrade is pretty uh, seamless if you want to move, just like you just, you can just move the card over maybe yeah. and it'll continue working. Um, if you're going to do Zigbee and Z-Wave devices, so these are devices that use a specific ra- uh, radio then uh, you need to get a dongle that supports those. There's like a handful of things that are supported on a list. Um, I went with the Go Control C E C O M I N O D zero one six one six four H U S B Z B dash one. Really rolls off the tongue. <laughs> it really does roll off the tongue. Uh, but it, it's a Z Wave slash Zigbee device. Uh, Home Assistant sees it just fine on the Raspberry Pi install. And it works like I've, I'm looking at it right now. It works great. There's a little blue light on it. Um, and then uh, you need uh, so the installing the OS is a lot like other Raspberry Pi projects. You don't have to install Raspbian or Raspberry Pi OS or anything like that. There's a there's a it's called Has OS install that basically has the Raspberry Pi, the Raspbian image pre configured. And you just burn that with Belina Etcher and jam the SD card in and you're good to go. Yeah. And then it walks you through the install. Like you've probably done the install process more recently than I have. Well, so, so I did it differently because of course I did. Um, I of used course. this. Well, so I use this as, a, as an excuse to get a Raspberry Pi 4 finally, which I had been putting off Ooh. until I had an actual project to do with it. Uh-huh. Um, I've got a one and a two. Uh, I've got nut running on the one and uh, pie hole running on the two. Um mm-hmm. But so I, I got the actually I, I convinced myself to get the Pi for uh, eight gigabyte model. Oh, hey, big spender. Because I want to do other stuff with it. Like I want to okay. like that's kind of the whole thing with having this free NAS machine. It's free BSD based and you can't do any of the fun Linux stuff you want without like 8000 headaches. Yeah. So I just wanted a nice little multipurpose Linux machine sitting around that I could tinker with and learn Linux better. See, this um, is this is why you need that Proxmox install on the NAS. Yeah, I, I, something about virtualizing still just doesn't sit right with me, man. Like, I just want to run <laughs> stuff on the bare metal. It's I'm just call me old fashioned. I don't know. <laughs> You're old fashioned. OS is inside of other OS is just it doesn't it feels icky. Look, man, it's the it, the whole world runs on virtualized I OSs. Know. I know, but the, the whole world doesn't run on my five year old gaming PC. <laughs> That's true. 
That's true. Um, I kind of squeeze every ounce of performance out of that thing. Anyway, um, the the point is, I wanted to. I actually put Ubuntu on uh, Ubuntu server on that Pi Four instead of oh. Raspbian, or I don't. Why did they change the name to Raspberry Pi OS? Uh, there were Raspbian uh, is such a better, and easier name. Red. Wait, really? See, see, uh, did, there did, somebody, was a... did somebody in the Debian community get mad that it sounded too similar or something? No, I think it was because they didn't want Raspberry Pi distributing images using the Raspbian name. So that's why I, there there was a post. Just this is why we need that spinoff podcast. Scene do, drama. Yep, scene drama. Yeah. Um, God, what were we talking about? Oh, uh, so, so I put I put Ubuntu server on there, which is, seems pretty nice now as far as Linux distros that are not Raspbian for a Pi. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, it's fine. Anyway, you're not wrong. Like the, the home assistant people have tons of fantastic guides and they have they have a guide on there for if you're familiar with Python somewhat, you can set up a virtual environment and install home assistant into that, and which is a nice encapsulated way to run it and still have access to the base system. So so when I did that, so that's how I did it on the FreeNAS jail. Um, and when I did that, a lot of stuff like the the some of the things that are really good features like the home assistant community store which is like basically they have different silos of integrations for hardware and like one is like the main branch stuff that's in the main github and then the other the other there's another one that is things that the community has developed that they make easy to install through this HACS thing that a different team team works on, uh, but but isn't necessarily vouched for by the core team. And I could never get that to work on the Python install. OK, so, so I'm, I'm glad you did it the mainstream way then, because, yes, there are some things I missed. In fact, the way I did it, they actually refer that to that as like Home Assistant Core, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so that's the, there's that store. Is that separate from the s- supervisor? The supervisor, because that's so another thing. I several missed out features on. that come that I could not get working on okay. free, free NAS. I, One was the file editor, the built in terminal, like all of, there's a lot of quality of life stuff. But the community store was the big thing, because okay. if you don't have the community store, then to install community add ons, you end up having to like curl into GitHub and run yeah. scri- installation scripts now off of GitHub. Talking. Which is fine Let me right tell up you. until the moment that you need to update something. <laughs> Dude, I was resisting the urge to talk about the case I got for that Pi 4. Oh, what'd you get? It, I got the Argon 1, which you should look up. It's just this fucking huge, solid hunk of aluminum. Okay. It comes with a daughter board on it that routes all the ports around to the back. Oh, it's I like got that. A, it's got a fan controller on it, and the way you install the fan controller software is to literally uh, <sighs> curl a, a .sh a shell script on their server and pipe it straight into your, into your shell. Also, uh, you become part of their botnet and yeah, they I always I, read the script. I actually read the entire script to see what was going on in there, and it's yeah. pretty benign. Um, Your Raspberry Pi is probably not mining Bitcoin. Then I was, congratulations! I was, I was very excited about the whole thing, but uh, but yeah, like there there are features that you get by going the pre-imaged kind of full install route that I don't have. So, what is the supervisor? Do you know? So, the supervisor is the thing that controls. Um, it, like it 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 is the thing that controls Home Assistant overall so so there's the os yes and then there's the program home assistant running and then there's a bunch of components inside home assistant and and this is one of the things that you learn the hard way doing this but like if you make a change to say a script or an automation or something like that unlike every sane piece of software i've ever used home assistant doesn't when you mash save reload those scripts for everything it it does that once you finish doing like you have to do it manually or you have to restart the server yes i have learned that Right. So the supervisor um, gives you access to this, the add on store, which is like a middle somewhere between the community store and the, the main core tools. Um, it gives you the ability to reboot the machine. It lets you see like system, how much RAM you're using, your change, your host name and IP address, okay. like like OS kind of stuff. Right. Sure. It lets you choose whether you're on the stable channel or the beta channel. OK. And it gives you log access to like system logs, not. Home assistant. Yeah, logs. that does sound pretty useful. I've gotten pretty used to just restarting the whole service every time I make a change, which yeah, I mean works. that. Well, so so you can do you can restart the individual bits in server controls in configuration. Like okay, so the, it's a it's a complicated piece of software. It, it is not the most user friendly thing I have ever encountered. It, it is, and there's like a lot of stuff that happens in multiple places, and sometimes that matters, and sometimes it doesn't. Like you, if if you are going to go this path, and you're used to using smart things. 
like a you're going to want to do a really gradual transition and get yeah. one like understand how something works on a room where your home automation shit being bad isn't going to annoy everybody else in your house. So like I, I've been working in my office for the last two months until I had a pretty good grasp on everything and then moved everything over. Um, but, but the, but the, like the thing I will say is the documentation generally is good. And if the documentation isn't, then there's a form thread and the forums, especially on the GitHub and the home assistant community forums are both pretty non-toxic as far as open source. Pro- like if you're used to free NAS forums, these are going to be really friendly and lovely <laughs> as long as you're not a jackass. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, um, so there are. I just want to rattle off some terms here. Yeah, hit me. Uh, just to give people kind of an idea of the scope of this thing. <laughs> when you load it up the, for the first time, there are devices, entities, yeah. mm-hmm. integrations, yep, automations, scripts, yep. scenes, yeah, areas, uh huh, zones, yeah. Have I missed any? No, oh, there's a bunch more. There's people. Oh there's users. Why are there people and users, Brad? Why, why are there areas and zones? Well, so users. I mean, I, use, I know the answer to that question, but it, so that's the thing, though. It's like you read all these terms and a lot of them sound relatively synonymous. And it's not that's what I mean about this not being the most intuitive thing is it's not always obvious. Like, what is the difference between a device and an entity? You know, why, what is it? How is an area distinct from a zone? That kind of thing. Well, so I think this isn't like a straight how to because your setup is going to be different than my setup and the listener setup is going to be different than either of our setups. But sure. There is a lot of stuff that I'm sure I found out the hard way and you're probably in the process of finding out right now. Mm -hmm. And I think we can go we can go through some of this stuff and it will help under help people understand this better. Actually, but before we get to that, like, I don't want to sound too critical of this thing because it seems pretty fantastic when you get your head around it. It's it's amazing. Like It is so good. But the thing I want to the thing I want to say in its favor is that so I installed it. I got it up and running. I went to the web interface and once I found my way to integrations, which turns out to be the kind of base level, like. Here's how you get your Samsung stuff in. Here's how you get your Apple stuff, your Google stuff, your Zigbee stuff. You know, it's like your the basic service layer. When I went there for the first time, it had found like everything on my network. So, and it, so that, including things I didn't know could be automated, like my Roku, my yep. Sonos, um, my little bootleg iTunes music server that I run on my NAS. Like it, it found a bunch of things that I didn't even think could be integrated into our kind of home automation ecosystem like it's pretty it's pretty impressive at auto detecting all that stuff so so the thing i will say is that right now but part of this is confusing because they're kind of in a transition period right now um early in the development of the software in order to add new integrations so an integration is is like the interface between home assistant and any other right. device right, right? So um, like a, a good example is we have we have a bunch of the tp link casa smart plugs because mm-hmm. they're because they're pretty cheap and my girlfriend yeah. got a, a couple from work for free. So we just have a lot of them. And so like adding the TP link Casa integration is what you do to get all of those into home assistant. Like that's, right. that's, that's an example. It's like a brand is associated with an integration essentially. And like, just to be clear, like it detected my printer. Yep. Uh, like it, not, it, yes. it, it knew that I have some IPP compatible printers. It, it added weather. It added my Lutron stuff. It added Logitech Harmony hubs. All of this stuff just got detected automatically. You can add stuff manually that it doesn't detect automatically. Um, but like, it's pretty that like that whole process was really straightforward. And, and that's kind of the beginning place. Now in the old days, there wasn't a web UI for setting this stuff up. You just Ooh. added, you like edited a YAML file. Yeah. And a lot of and, the documentation you'll find out there is still very much based on editing YAML files. <laughs> well, and, and some of the integrations like to add Alexa and Google support manually, uh, Google assistant support manually, you have to do YAML files. Um, you have to edit the YAML file. It's there, there's not, it's not like writing Python code or even scripting. YAML stands for yet another markup language. So it's kind of like HTML. In Wait, isn't the, it, I think it, hang on, isn't it recursive? I think oh, it's, is isn't it? it YAML ain't a markup language. Oh, maybe it, it might be yes. yeah, YAML ain't yes. a markup language. Yes, yes, that's what it is. Shit. Anyway, so uh, the upshot is the language is really easy to understand just by looking at it. Like it's, it's just like a series yeah. of nested tags and it's, you can kind of put things in and out and it's, it's not, it's not hard. I, to I use. think it's, it's more straightforward than Jason from what I've seen. It is way easier than Jason. Um, it is probably easier even than HTML other than the fact that people learn HTML in middle school. Yeah. Um, the, the, but, but most of the stuff that you're going to use probably now and going forward will hopefully have like the web based integration because that's, that's a little bit easier to manage. Yes, yeah, a little um, bit. But like <laughs> I should point out when you add devices, there's still a lot of like 
names with a lot of underscores in them and like kind of very technical terminology applied to a lot of stuff. Like it's well, not, it is, it is no, like it is no Apple home or something like that. Like it's not it, that user friendly. You, so, so what you're trading when you go with home assistant over Apple home or smart things or something like that is a lot more pain on the setup that you do presumably one time and then never futz with again yeah. uh, for um, the ability <clears throat> to do much, 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 much more complicated uh, uh, automations yes. with a wider variety of devices and APIs. Yes. So like there's a fair amount, like for example, to set up the Lutron switches that I have because my house has two wires. So Lutron cassetta switches will smart switches will work with two wire houses with, with no neutral. And in order to set those up, you have to have a hub, but you have to get an API key. And the only way you can get an API key is by logging into the specific website with a preformed header. So you basically install a pl- an add on to home assistant that generates the API key. And then you copy that API key and put it in the YAML file. And then it just shows up and starts working magically. Like you don't have to do anything else. That is both very cool to me. And also it sounds like a giant pain in the ass. Also, can I derail you for a second? It's a pain in the ass one time. Like that's, that's like all this stuff we're talking about so far is single use hassle for right. long-term comfort. Yes. I have to, derail. I have to uh, derail. What is, what is, what is this two wire house business? Is that some homeowner thing that everybody who owns a house Uh-oh. knows? Okay, about so if, you, <laughs> if you have a house that was built after like 19, somewhere in the, between the seventies and nineties, depending on where you are and what code is, there's three wires going to every light switch. There's a, a hot, a ground, and then a neutral wire. Huh. Um, The neutral wire basically lets it shut off excess energy. So if you have like a dimmer and you don't need all the electricity going to the lights, some of it goes down the neutral. And I I don't know what happens to it at that point. Magic happens. (laughs) Didn't do either. Um, If you have an old house like I do, you have two wires coming into everything. And there's there's an assumption that somewhere between those two wires is going to be a thing that turns on or off. And that's what makes the light work. And if you want to have smart dimmers on incandescent on non-incandescent bulbs you have to have somewhere for that extra energy to go except lutron has figured some shit out and patented ah. it so they're the only ones that have it that works i see yeah all right um or maybe they're the only ones that have bothered to do it the upshot is if you if you have a two wire house until the lutron cassetta stuff came out you were probably better off getting smart bulbs rather than trying to find smart switches that would work anyway okay so we talked about integrations uh devices and entities Entities are each like physical device. Wait, really? I thought that was devices. <laughs> no, no, no. All uh, right, this is educational for me an, too. A, an entity is a container. Okay. De- sorry, other way around. You're right. You're right. Oh, it is. Devices okay. are the okay. container, and each device can have multiple entities attached to it. Uh, okay. Yes. So, it, for example, is, yes, we were not kidding. Like this stuff is really hard to keep track of. <laughs> yeah. For, for example, like if you have a smart plug, often they will tell you like how much energy is being used in a given moment. Uh, so. A a smart plug device might have an on off entity that controls whether that switch is getting power or not. Another entity for how much power if it's like a dimmable switch and a third for how much power it's actually consuming at any given moment. Okay, this is starting to make sense. Yeah. So um, let's see another example. Like I have an Aeon Labs motion sensor in the living room that also measures temperature, humidity, uh, luminosity, and I think noise, maybe one other thing. You know what? Um, the, you know what and the each actual, of those is entities under that one device. Yes. So you know the actual most extreme example. I don't know if you have you paired any mobile devices with this thing. Oh yeah, your like phone, your phone? Gets, oh, so goes. I'm ham. sitting here. My my iPhone eight has roughly a dozen different entities associated with it. So like, battery state, connection type, distance, floors ascended, floors descended. Yep. Uh, geocoded location, activity, mm-hmm. battery. Did I say battery level? No, but uh, it's in there too. Yeah. Battery level, a- average active pace, like like all of those things are broken out as separate things that Home Assistant tracks. And presumably, I assume you could tie automations and like scripting stuff to any one or multiple of those things. Like, yeah, like that, that that's where the magic and I haven't dug into the stuff really at all. I know you have a little bit, but that's where that's where the potential for magic seems to be with this thing is like the ways that you can mix and match data from different devices to come up with like these ridiculous automation scenarios based on like eight bajillion criteria seems like pretty awesome. So I have a weather station that Tina and my daughter got me a few years ago for Christmas. And when I connected that thing in it, it popped like 65 different things. Cause not only does it give me like the temperature, the carbon dioxide, the humidity, the noise level, the barometric pressure. It also gives like how, what the battery state for the devices and like whether, whether when they last connected to the radio and whether they can be pinged right now. And 
Like it's it's it is pretty ridiculous. Anyway, so okay, so that's devices and entities. Um, when you set these up, you can choose to name them. It is very important that you give them names <laughs> that you're going to be able to tell what they are. Yes, because sometimes it's really hard to tell what's what. It's also super important that you give everything a distinct name, and you want to do all of that before you start making any automations because the automations are just flat text files that, oh. that the thing generates. So if you change the name of an entity or device after you've created automations, oh. you're going to have to go back into oh. those automations and manually change the names uh, to oh, match the names that you changed it to. That really hurts. Yeah. Um, so areas and zones. This is an easy one. Uh, an area is a room in your house. A zone is any place else in the world that you're interested in something happening when a person from your house goes into or out of. What? So, for example, if you wanted to have some automation happen at your house when you reach the office at home at work, imagine a time when we left okay. the house. OK, sure. Um, or if I wanted to have something happen when my daughter gets to school, like if I want if my daughter gets on the bus in the morning, I want to get a notification when she arrives at school. I can trigger that using zones. That that is extremely cool and also kind of terrifying. <laughs> uh, I I mean, look the the there's there's so Gene and I have shared locations with each other for years now. Okay, it is incredibly useful for me to or for her when like she's like, hey, can you stop at the grocery store? Yeah. to know when I'm in the car and not have to like call me and be like hey are you in the car i need you to stop and get some hot dogs or whatever totally, on the way home totally. from work I'm, I'm sure like parenting is is such a uh kind of seat of your pants situation that privacy is a secondary concern to just getting things done well i mean it, it, it yeah i guess i mean i look i don't i everybody's relationships are different i oh, don't totally yeah. You, yeah like like yeah we're not doing anyway that's a whole different conversation um but the upshot on this is that i want to make the weasley clock from harry potter which i don't like the, <laughs> okay. the the weasleys have this clock where they're like there's a hand for each kid each person in the family and like they point toward work and school and home oh, and mortal what? peril and oh, wow like and you could totally do that using zones man that's cool right like it's such huh. a stupid thing um but but like i was even thinking about just doing like an lcd screen with like with like the letter lcd screens like a train terminal the kind of thing that just pops up and is like okay will is at is sitting in the office wow. gina is at school yeah kiddo is uh, you know out in mortal peril right so so this is the actual reason i really wanted to do this episode like all i've done with home assistant so far is just replicate the functionality that should have worked in apple home and did not oh, right well that's but, where you should start that's the that's, totally, the, that's totally. the kickoff point but but you've you've started doing some actual creative stuff and like i really just wanted to like hear some cool ideas can i can i say the one that you told me about that i thought was super cool or should we save that well, I was going to talk about automations and scripts and scenes okay, next, we'll, so we can we'll, just we'll, go right but, do it. Okay. Um, so, okay. So automation, scripts, and scenes kind of all work together. Um, a scene, and, and just to be clear, the automations are what differentiate Home Assistant from SmartThings and Wink and HomeKit and all the other stuff. Um, you can You can do like... You can have scripts that call each other and do all sorts of weird business and like they can talk back and forth. You can't really share variables between scripts and stuff like that, at least not without delving into Python. Um, but it also you can write Python scripts for this. If, you, if you're a Python person, you want to get into that, you can do that. Um, but so um, automations make things happen based on something else happening. So you you can set a trigger. For example, uh, there's motion on the motion sensor in my office, right? Oh, I should turn the lights on in the office. That's an automation. Um, you can also connect it to APIs and trigger those uh, those actions based on external APIs. So, um, for example, I have mine hooked up to my Google Calendar and my Twitch uh, Twitch API. So when Home Assistant sees that my Twitch stream is live, it's like, oh, he's probably in his office. I should turn the lights up to stream God, settings. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, that's when, so when I have cool. a meeting. When there's a busy status on my calendar, it's like, oh, it, it, I should turn the lights on so that his Zoom call is properly. Yeah, that is so damn cool. Uh, uh, God, you know what? Actually, I think like it detected my Elgato key light, I want to say. Yeah, you can do that. That one's that one fires. So you could, like, tell you can it, do this. Tell tell that fucking bright ass light to come on in my face every time it's time to stream. Well, it's tricky for you because you share a channel with a bunch of other people. So right, what happens right, is right, like right, when right. Abby like fires up the giant bomb yes. account, your lights are going to be on full blast, which maybe would, is not desired. 
there's there's probably a way for it to monitor like processes running on a, a machine and look for 100 percent like straight up peak grab it or something look for look for a specific process to, to appear and then do it or whatever uh, um, you can 100 percent trigger that um, so so setting up oh, i'm sorry i was just gonna mention real quick so like setting up automations is when i first had it was when i had my first like kind of little magical moment with this thing of like mm-hmm. oh the potential of this is far greater than the commercial solutions have been using um because i was setting all the automations up to just have lights come on at certain times that's what we did with home yeah and when I was setting up, uh, we have a we have a little it's a it's an orange LED light bulb in the bedroom and one of the lamps, which is just a nice evening kind of nighttime light. Yeah, warm. That we have come on in the evening just to keep that room uh, illuminated. And throughout the year, I would ride that automation in Apple Home and like update it every two, three months as the length of days changed. I was going to punch a time into the automation in Home Assistant. And one of the options was just sunset <laughs> or sunset with an offset you know it's like 15 minutes before sunset or after sunset and i was like oh my god like this is gonna be awesome brad here's a fun one uh home uh, my house the the west facing exposure for my house has a mountain on the south side of it so the sun that means the sun goes down an hour earlier in the winter time than it does in the summer sure so you can just set it to like an angle above yes. or below the horizon. Yes, if I you saw want. that. I saw that. Like, you can literally like, you punch can go in the, ham with this. That's the what. That's not the. It's as, the sun as, integration. What is, what is the as? No, no, no. The term for oh, uh, what is, what is uh, as, the azimuth, azimuth is azimuth is something different, right? Azimuth is the angle. I think I can't remember. We're gonna get this wrong. Yeah, that's why I'm afraid to mention it because I I started looking that stuff up after I saw this in Home Assistant. And I don't, don't know that I should do that. Here I am on the NOAA solar position calculator now, which is maybe beyond me. <laughs> um, you, look, you're going to have to fire this up in Kerbal to get a real right, understanding. Totally. Uh, but um, uh, like I should I should mention, like, yeah, the reason it knows sunset is because it's pulling in weather data. So you could probably say, like, hey, turn on the lights or turn on whatever you have access to when it's raining outside, you know, or when it's below you, 50 degrees outside or in the house or you, you know. can absolutely do that. And then, yeah. and you can also do like normal home, the like home automation stuff, like when I open my back door, any of my exterior doors, the like the light, the outside lights that are next to those turn on. Right. When somebody walks up to the front doorbell, which has a motion sensor, it turns on the front porch light. So like when the pizza guy comes, he's not standing out there in the dark. Um, all, all of that stuff is, is really convenient, but, but like really it's the thing that is broader here is the ability to do things like hook up to your Google calendar and things like that, yeah. which smart things, a, I wouldn't give Samsung that access to data, but because it's running on a machine that's inside my, my house and I'm the only one in charge of, I, I feel okay about it. Yeah. I, I enjoyed when in the, in the very first page of the initial setup of this thing, they emphasize like, Hey, none of your data will be shared outside of the server. Like, like this yeah. is privacy is a major concern here. Um, it's got, uh, just real quick on like in, in that vein of trying to do, if you're trying to, if you're really a DIY type and you're concerned about privacy and data and stuff like that, um, it's even got like an FFmpeg integration that can handle webcams, like, or, oh, yeah. or sec- like secure security cameras. Like I've, I've seen people talking about like, you can use like cheap raspberry Pis and, and dumb webcams as security cameras that feed into this thing. And well, you, you can also like buy IP, what are called IP cams that don't okay. connect to a cloud service. Right. That then you just point those IPs at the things. I don't know how that would run on the Raspberry Pis. Okay. Um, and also, like, you do want to minimize the rights that you do to SD cards. Uh, it's a good sure, idea to buy sure. app compatible SD cards because they're set up for more rights. But oh, like, yeah. you don't want to have logs on for this because you'll burn out your SD card yeah. or, or fast. And certainly, yeah, if you were funneling footage to something, you would want to yeah. save it to an external drive. But yeah, this is a hard drive situation. Um, yeah. OK, so automations, they make things happen based on something else happening, based on a trigger. Right. Uh, a scene is it just a collection of devices in a specific state? So if you think about, so so basically if you're setting up an automation and you want the lights to be in like nighttime mode when three different things happen, you can set up three automations and you can go in and manually select all of those items that you want to be that way. Or you can make a scene that is the way you want those lights to be when any of those three things happens and then make three automations that just say, hey, call this scene. Yes. When so that, this happens. That's, that's exactly right. So like, for example, I've got an LED light strip on the back of my desk, just kind of mm-hmm. illuminates the, the wall. Yeah. Backsplash. Like, it's nice. Totally. And like, I, I want that to come on in the morning at like a nice, very low brightness, like a nice orange, you know, something to wake up to. Um, so, yes, I made a scene that was like light strip on brightness, 5% orange, whatever hex code for the orange color or whatever. You know what I mean? And like, and, and like you said, yes, then you can trigger that at any time. You can just say activate the scene instead of activating this device. And mm-hmm. you can set that up for different colors or different states. Uh, so 
So now, but what if you wanted to make that light change color temperature throughout the day or like uh, and and go from like orange to blue and then back to orange, right? Yes. So you would, instead of calling that scene, you would call a script, which is basically an automation that happens independent of a trigger. You don't need it. It's it's triggered by something else, either manually by like a voice assistant call or by another automation. And uh, so you would say, okay, over the next 10 hours, change this from this hex to this hex to this hex. With like a five minute increment or something like that or interval rather. Yeah. Like you'd, yeah, you'd, you'd have to do a little bit of math probably to figure it out. Um, But yeah. And, and that's how that like, basically that's how that would work. So things that I use. um, So for example, uh, to go back one step for scenes, I have a scene for my office when it's empty. I have a scene for my office office when I'm working and I want it to be kind of dim, which is what it's on right now. And then I have a scene for like eye blasting bright. I'm, I'm, I'm shooting video in here. Um, you know, I have a scene for, uh, dusk when the, when it starts to get dark outside, I have a scene for after my daughter goes to bed, I have a scene for late night, like after 10 o'clock. And then I have a scene, two different scenes for bedtime, for like turning off all the lights in the house and turning off all the lights in my master bedroom so that like if Gina or I go to bed in different orders, we, it works for either of us, no matter no matter wh- whether I'm in bed reading a book and want the light on or she's in the living room and wants the lights on out there while I'm in bed and want the light off. So how do you write scripts? Do you have to write them from scratch? Like is it a straight up text editor just like go? Like I assume uh, that's, that's not they don't really hold your hand for those, I assume. So you can do that if you want. There's the the script builder right now is one of the things I think is in pretty active development. And you, you, like you can um, I'm going to it right now so I can see what it looks like. The last time I looked at it, it looked like a JV version of the automation builder, Okay, yeah, which is what it is. It's basically like the same as the automation creator. If if you get to a point where you can't do what you want to do with the creator, with the creator tool, you can just write straight code. And, and what are you writing there? That's, that's like, my real question. Is it some? Sp- it's YAML, or I think you can call Python scripts as well. Okay. Okay. Um. So things I use scripts for, like uh, it's uh, another way to think of scripts are they're like scenes, but with logic. So, for example, I'll fire up. I have a script that when I want to like lay in bed and watch some Star Trek: The Next Generation, but I'm afraid I won't fall asleep and don't want the TV going until three o'clock in the morning. I say, you know, okay, Google, turn off the TV in a bit, and it starts a script that runs for 30 minutes and kills the TV at, at that point uh, after 30 minutes. Uh, and that, that uses a Roku integration. So it was really straightforward and simple. I can only help you with oh. the first request. Ah. <laughs> Go away, Google. You got it. I, <laughs> dude, I think I, <laughs> My bad. I'm starting, starting to detect a downside Don't to all of this home it. automation. <laughs> I really hope that's picking uh, up on your recording. <laughs> so, um, and then the last thing, the last big thing is the Loveless dashboards, the Lovelace dashboards. Yeah. And that's the thing that you see on that overview page. It's the first thing it shows you when you connect, I think, uh, after you've set it up. And the default one is comp- controlled by the computer and basically has everything on it. So you kind of want to leave that one alone. Um, you don't, generally speaking, you don't probably want to start customizing these until you're pretty sure you have all of the devices you're going to want to put on, at least in the first, like, like with what you have right now, because uh, once you customize a dashboard, you it doesn't automatically add new stuff to it anymore. So um, but like I have a, a dashboard for Gina that's just like the rooms and the lights and the speakers and the washer and dryer. Yeah. And there are um, mobile apps. We should point out there are iOS and Android apps that basically they basically just replicate the web interface as far as I can tell. Well, no, they also do. Or, they also do presence. So they'll connect you to zone like you can get the zone information like where your phone is um, either through the Home Assistant app or through Apple's iCloud implementation. OK, I find the iCloud app implementation to be really fucking annoying if you have two factor on for your iOS, for your I- iCloud account. So I disabled it and turned it off entirely. Right. Uh, and I only mm-hmm. do uh, the the Home Assistant configuration okay. now yeah but I, I mean as far as the on-screen interface it basically is the web interface so any what i mean is any like yeah, custom, yeah it's the any, same thing you see any, the same any thing any customization you do on dashboards on the web interface will show up in the apps as well that's right and i think in the app you can say which dashboard you want to see by default too oh cool which is nice 
Um, so there's stuff you should know. Like this is this is the stuff that is important. We talked about reloading. Anytime you write a new script or add a new automation or add a new scene or um, change an area, change a zone, change a person, change a user, any of that stuff, you got to reload the appropriate part. And if you don't know which part to reload, just restart this this the restart the Home Assistant application, which is in configuration server controls restart. Yeah, simple. It's not that, not that it's not it's not that slow. If you're on a reasonably fast Pi, it only takes a few seconds for me. Well, so if you reboot the Pi, it takes uh, yeah, a long yeah, yeah. time. Yeah, well, I mean, if you I restart just mean, the re- server, it just takes a just minute. The, yeah, that's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Um, if you're going to do this and you want it to work when you're on your phone away from the house, you need to have dynamic DNS set up. Um, there's a add on in supervisor that is called duck dns that will do that it'll generate a let's encrypt ssl certificate oh, that's cool. I didn't the know whole they, thing I didn't it's know they free all that stuff in there that's great yeah it's fabulous um and it took like that took like 20 minutes to set up it was really easy yeah so essentially you would forward ports or a port probably to you, you forward one port to the machine then, that it's running on and then yeah and you've got a domain yep. you can access externally or, or you know, if, like if you've got a vpn set up like i do you could just vpn and Get that, that way too. as well. Yeah. Uh, the benefit of not the benefit of doing the dynamic DNS versus the VPN is that anytime the VPN isn't active, you won't get notifications. But if you oh, do the sure. DNS, the d- dynamic DNS thing, you will. Sure. Um, the voice assistant integrations are challenging. Hmm. So there's two iOS integrations for Apple users. One is um, one is the iCloud one I said before, which is bad if you use two factor. The other is HomeKit which it'll detect if you have iOS devices on your network. Um, The HomeKit one is great. It gives you Siri support on your devices. You'll have to go in and manually configure. And and this is one of the places that that, um, if you have a lot of devices, especially, you can go into the configuration YAML and limit the devices, the, the types of devices that are exposed to any integration. So for example, like I don't need to show all my Google speakers to Siri. To, to HomeKit, so you can just say, okay, I only want to, I only want these this these specific categories of devices. I want automations and scripts and switches and sensors, but I don't want since I'm not doing any logic in HomeKit, I don't have motion sensors or anything like that showing up in HomeKit. Sure. Um, in order for you to use it with Siri, it has to be exposed to the HomeKit integration in the configuration.yaml. Um, the other voice assistant integrations, if you want to do them, are a hassle. Uh, you have to set up uh, developer accounts for Amazon and Google. Yikes. Uh, you have to create some like private apps and there's the documentation was really good. And if you follow it exactly, it works. It worked. I've done it twice now. It worked both times really easily, but it is it was time consuming and you have to have dynamic DNS because the 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 apps that you create in Amazon and Google's cloud respectively have to be able to talk to your device. Sure. So um like and and also the Google one, it seems like maybe you have to log into that console every 60 days. That's unclear to me because I, I anyway, it's it's not great. You can also pay the developers of Home Assistant five bucks a month because they provide Home Assistant Cloud for that, which also supports the project as a whole. So if you don't want to fool with that, you don't have to. You just you're going to go from, you know, you, you're paying somebody and the data is then leaving your house a little bit. That's cool. Um, there's some stuff that's still janky. Like I can't get Sonos to play a Spotify playlist, no matter what I do. Sure. Like I can do local playlists. I can do like all sorts of other play playlists, but no, no Spotify. uh, That's, you know, that that's open source projects. That's to be expected. (laughs) Something's always going to be a little bit off. It's true. Um, that is true. I, I have a couple of iDevices plugs that I could not get added under their integration until I did a couple of factory resets on them and had to add them back through home again first. And then they finally, they were just throwing a generic error that I could not figure out. Until I that, so th- like the figuring out where to find the errors is one of the big challenges of this. Yeah. Because yeah. there's like a lot of different logs. And like if you're using yes. Z-Wave and Zigbee devices, Zigbee devices, then those logs are in a different place than um like the normal home assistant logs yeah. like it's 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 a lot I, the, the, the error in the web ui on those I, I think quite literally included language along the lines of we don't know what happened and then i looked in the console on the pi and there was a much more detailed error message that actually implied some information there so yeah yes. it's it um especially when you're setting this up it's really helpful to go ahead and set up ssh yes. which i think you can do in the add-on store in the supervisor okay 
yeah, there's a terminal in SSH client that puts a terminal plugin on your like left menu bar, but also lets you SSH into the device. Cool. Like it lets you set up the stuff to SSH into the device, yeah. which is really handy. Yeah. As as um, with most most things of this nature, like some baseline Unix slash Linux experience is very helpful. If you uh, it, it, mm. it's not required but like it can come in handy when you're trying to troubleshoot and stuff if, like if that something goes real wrong yeah yeah um one of the other nice things about the supervisor plugin is it lets you create snapshots of configs when things are working well oh okay um, that's that's good to know i was going to ask even even separate from the supervisor is there just an easy way to export your config just to be safe like is, is there a single yaml you can pull out of there and just back no, it up there's or? a bunch of yamls yeah, i, I, was, I, I was really afraid curious about i don't know because okay. Like in the old days when it was just YAML files, yes, you could just copy the YAML files and it would just know what to do. Now, I, I don't know what happens to all okay. that. And that's one of the that's one of the it's on my I've got to figure this out before something goes wrong with this thing. Yeah. List. Um, that's probably pretty easy to Google. I'm surely somebody in their community has addressed that in a guide or something. I would hope so. But um, I, I there's a lot of setup to have to do again if something were to go wrong, if your SD card died or something like that. I yeah, I mean, I'm going to make sure that this is really well backed up, back, yeah. backed up after yeah. I get everything working the way I want it. Or so you could do the same thing I do with my other pies on just image that SD card and back that up. That's true. Um, there's there's um, OK, so there's a few things to know as you're transitioning that I learned the hard way. Um, one is that before you disconnect your old hub, if you're using Z-Wave devices, especially use the Z-Wave exclude feature on the old hub, which will make the new Z-Wave, the Z-Wave devices much easier to pair with the new uh, devices. It's really important if you're using Z-Wave secure or whatever their encrypted thing is, because they they don't they you might end up with like an orphan device that you can't unpair if yeah. you don't do the exclusion first. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a bunch of little gotchas like that, like those iDevices plugs I mentioned. There's no way to add those to your Wi-Fi without adding them in home. That's the only way that you can tell it what the SSID and the oh, password God. and stuff are. So you have to add those to home. You have to like I literally didn't even have a home anymore because I had deleted it because I was getting off that platform and I had to go make a new one and add those back through that app just to get them on my Wi-Fi. And then you have to remove them from home and then Home Assistant can see them, blah, blah, blah. I was gonna, bunch, like depending on your devices, there may be some hoops you're going to have to jump through and some some things to to take note of. One of the things I'm going to add to this list of best practices is don't turn off the don't like dis, don't kill the old hub until you have the new thing working. <laughs> yes, because um, a, a stuff like that happens where you have to have the old hub to disassociate the old devices or set up the new set them up with a new account. But B, it's also really convenient to look at like timings on automations and stuff like that on the old one before you move everything off. Yeah. Um, uh, start. I, I, I said this before, but start with one room. That'll be easy and use that to learn all the weirdness about how the automations work and the scripts and like when you want an automation, when you want a scene, when you want a script, all that stuff. Um, remember, uh, that if you, oh, right. Um, so the devices that use Zigbee and Z-Wave and connect, communicate directly with the old hub will stop working with the old hub when you move them off. But devices that use APIs to connect like Philips Hue and the Lutron stuff and all, Sonos and all these other ones will continue working with both hubs. So it can make troubleshooting <laughs> automation problems really weird. Cause like, yeah. They're they're fighting with each other for control over the over the devices. Yeah. Um, so that, that that leads me to something quick I wanted to touch on, and this is you know this is only relevant for some people uh, if you're coming from Apple Home like I was. But f so this thing accomplished my goal of just make all our damn devices work on one platform consistently yeah. and make it so that we both me and my girlfriend can access them. Blah blah blah, and don't kill my iPad battery. Right, like that's all I cared about. But um, there is a God. Is it? I think it's the Home HomeKit Bridge is the one I'm thinking of here. Yeah, there's HomeKit also, Bridge. I believe is HomeKit Controller is how you add HomeKit devices to Home Assistant. Home, HomeKit Bridge then exposes all those devices you've added to Home Assistant back to the Home app on iOS. Does that make so, sense? So you shouldn't need. Oh yeah, you might need the HomeKit. It's so so I don't have any HomeKit pure HomeKit devices, so I haven't had to yeah, use the first we've one. Got of a, those. We've got a decent number of those, but but the the point is. Um, uh, using that HomeKit bridge adds all those devices back into the home app, which makes them show up in like control center as nice little shortcuts just to toggle stuff on and off. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice way to like replicate that user experience for my girlfriend and not make her deal with the home assistant app. Um, well, so I was going to say the neat thing about uh, the neat thing about the way this works is if you, once you get everything set up, right, 
you can control exactly what gets exposed yes. back on that home kit totally. bridge That's the cool using thing. the YAML file. Yeah. And, and uh, you can even like go all the way down. So like with, with smart things, I was never, never able to get the same automations working on Google. So like if I wanted to make the, the, my daughter's bedroom, get into time for her to go to sleep mode, I had to do that on Alexa, but like going to bed was on Google because there's an Alexa near her bedroom and there's a Google in our bedroom. Right. So now I have the same automations going to all the same places and the same trigger phrases are on everything. And it means that it's much, much simpler to and sort of more straightforward to use now. Totally. Totally. Um, the, the the you get the same benefit that you're talking about with the Google with the Apple Home stuff with the Google Home, sorry Google Assistant integration if you set that up or yeah. use the Home Assistant Cloud. Yeah, I would I would assume that exists for probably most of the major platforms that you can essentially kind of re-expose all this stuff back out to those to those interfaces. It, it depends, but okay. yeah, like like for example, you can do things. Like I have an automation set up now that talks to our LG washers. That when the laundry is done, it it says on the Alexa in the living room and the Google speaker in the dining room, hey, the laundry's done. Right. Wow. And it can like you can flash the lights and do all sorts yeah. of stupid God, stuff. That's cool. So that reminds yeah. me, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we didn't actually t- talk about your project that had wowed me so much. Oh, yeah. Which it ended was... up being really annoying. So I turned ah. it off. <laughs> Okay then, maybe never mind. But um, um, and and this is very much a California, Northern California thing right now. I think it's the entire West. I think we can yeah, say okay, maybe fair. even maybe even like Western, Eastern Australia too. Probably sure. is impacted. In, yeah, increasingly more and more of the globe is dealing with air quality issues yeah. and lots and, of China, and raging wildfires. Sure, yeah, pollution. It's all over the place. It's just going to yeah. be more. Impor- anyway, you. You tied a, uh, I don't know what kind of light bulb it was, but one of the LED types that can change colors into was, the air quality index data yeah, so feed. I, there's a, there was a script that somebody wrote. Um, I sent you the link to it earlier, but okay. uh, let me, I'll, we'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, there's a script that somebody wrote that basically, um, it's some guy named Ben, uh, basically lets you sync the air quality color index. So like green is good. Yellow is okay. Orange is bad. Red is don't go outside. Pur- purple uh, is purple has, is just, hazmat suit. Right. Like I hope you have a bunny suit to an RGB light in home assistant. And I did that while the fires were bad here. Cause it was kind of nice to know. Oh, like, that's awesome. Put a mask on. Yeah. Cause we were checking that thing a dozen oh, times, times a day. A day sometimes. Yeah. Easily. Yeah, totally. Um, so just being able I, to glance at a light and see what color it is and know how the air is outside is, is pretty cool. I ended up turning it off. Cause like when it's green, like green, a, the hue bulbs that I was using don't do green particularly well. Yeah. Um, so you couldn't kind of tell if it was green or yellow. <laughs> Uh, but B, I it we stopped needing it. Sure. So I, yeah, so I was just green, normal green, light bulb back. Green, yeah. Most of the time at that point. But it but yeah. it is a good little example of some of the cool creative ideas you can do with this thing. Like I mean, the, we said this before. We talked about home home automation stuff. It's not something anybody needs. I mean, <laughs> I was kind of having. I had that idea several times during this conversation. It's. I mean. That's not true. When my daughter was very young and we were walking like we were you're constantly carrying a child, being able to have lights come on in a room without having to touch anything. It was often very valuable, you know, because you have one hand at best. If you're if you're if you have disabilities, I can definitely see the benefit of being able to do a lot of this stuff by saying things rather than having to hit something. Yeah. Um, By and large, it's a convenience thing, not a necessity. But like, you know, like having that that little orange lamp in our bedroom come on. Yeah. Tracked tracked with the sunset every day of the year and never have to touch that again is pretty nice little convenience. It's it's fun and it's convenient. And the funny thing is, like I started out doing this in, in, and the tra- the transition with Gina was from this thing is annoying. It never works to when we added the voice assistance, she was like, Oh, okay, this is kind of useful. I get it to when things just started happening without having to think about them. <laughs> when you go, like when we go visit my parents and they just have light switches, a, my daughter was really excited because she'd never really gotten to use a light switch before. <laughs> um, but B it feels archaic to walk into a room and not have the lights be like what you want to do what you want them to do that's, that's how you know you're living in the future yeah um so but it's still it's a hobby thing it's not something yeah, that you absolutely yes, have to yes. do it is, it is a fun tinkering project if you're into that kind of thing and i think my total spend so it would have been 50 or 100 bucks to buy a new smart things hub i paid 30 bucks for the raspberry pi and i think 40 bucks for the dongle yeah 
Um, yes, so you can do it's it, like do it on a the little sheet. bit more, but I'm not paying a monthly fee. So I figure it's probably okay. Yes. Um, and if you have questions, I guess post them in the Discord. Uh, yeah. That's it. That's a, what I got. Need, do we need a home automation channel? I mean, we kind of. I mean, let's see. Let's see where this takes us. Yeah, we're my adding, guess is we're adding, adding channels at a pretty good clip. There's probably I mean, two or three people at a pretty good clip too. That's, that's so fair. there's probably two or three places that that would f- sit already. But like I, I feel like it lives often in just network things. Yes. Or Linux talk. No key yes. shaming. Yes. Um, but speaking of the Discord, if you would like to get access to the fabulous TechPod Discord, full of uh, brilliant people like uh, you and <laughs> and the other thirteen hundred people in there, twelve hundred and eighty yes. people in there, yes, um, we would love to have you. You can do that by going to Patreon.com/slash/TechPod. That's Patreon.com/slash/TechPod, uh, and uh, it's two bucks a month to get access to the Discord, which uh, a helps support the podcast, yes, and. B ensures that the people that join the podcast are uh, join the, the discord are, uh, you know, they're not rapscallions. No, it's a very not. lovely community. There's, there's so much great stuff on there. I, the, the other day, there was an amazing moment where a very delightful Canadian member of the discord was telling everyone about his Internet trash can. What? <laughs> oh, I really, missed this. You should really scroll back and find that Internet trash can conversation. What's- what, 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 hold on, you got well, I, I don't want to. Well, I, I don't want to oh, okay, really okay. spoil it, but it's it's a it's a classic looking metal trash can that actually houses some Raspberry Pis and a lot of other cool sensor type stuff, doing all kinds of things. That sounds awesome, and it's a pretty ambitious project that you should look at. It was pretty neat. Uh, um, I've had extended conversations about uh, low latency monitors and mm-hmm. Peaker's advantage. We talk about Hades in the Hades Appreciation slash Gaming channel. Yes, um, and and there there just there continue to be a lot of people in there that work in very advanced high tech fields that have a lot of very specific and high level knowledge about things that is, is super fun to to talk to. I, yeah. I would like to talk to some of them on the show. I feel like that may be weird, but uh, I yeah. I think we're going to do it anyway. Um, so yeah, if you want to join, you can do that at patreon.com slash tech pod. Uh, if you sign up for a few bucks a month more than that, then you get access to the patron exclusive episode, which comes out once a month and we have to record sometime in the next couple of days, I guess. Uh, I think yes. this month we're going to talk about the Stephen King short oh, story, the jaunt. the jaunt. Talk about yeah. uh, when you read the jaunt and told me you read the jaunt. I've almost wanted to record that podcast, we, right? I wish right we had there. now. That would have been really smart. Well, it was fresh in your mind, but uh, yeah, I can read It's short. I'll read it again. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, and yeah. as always, we need to support our patron. Uh, we need to thank our patrons, the people yes. who make the show possible. So uh, thanks to all 1200, it's 1235 uh, patrons, but uh, very special thanks to our executive producer level patrons, Andrew Cotton, David Allen and Jacob Chappell, uh, as well as since it's the end of the month. Uh, thanks to our associate producer level patrons, Arthur Gies, Ben Gulmi, uh, Dan Brockman, Dave Ulian, Graham Banks, Jacob W., Jad Rita, Terry Cox, the Bunny Fiend, the Bunny Fiend, Tom, and Thomas Shea. Thank you all so much. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. supporting thank the you show. Add to everybody who who supports us for sure. I was what was what's the number twelve? I have to sit here and say thank 1235 you. Twelve hundred and thirty five right okay. now. All right, here we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't have enough fingers. Just, just you, know, you got it. You got it. you got like twelve hundred and thirty to go. There's a lot of engineers around here. Just thank you to asterisk twelve thirty five. Okay. <laughs> I feel like that was a cheat. Well, well, the next month's patron episode is Brad going down the list and thanking every single patron by name. If I just write a little shell script to. <laughs> we can export the CSV. Parse, yes. Parse whatever some data out of. Yes. Okay. I do have that voice generator. <laughs> oh, boy. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, if you'd like to support the 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 show again, it's patreon.com slash tech pod. I my favorite part of the day is when I have a moment and can dip in. And usually I just pick a random channel and see what people are talking about. And it's always something fascinating. Like there's a keyboard channel. We got uh, just general maker stuff. The food channel is is if you need recipe ideas, man, get in that food channel. Yes. Um, it's very good. If you want to talk about work. Yeah. People requested a work and career stuff kind of channel. And now we have it. There you go. It's all in there. Uh, And we would love to see you uh, wonderful people in there as well. I guess that's it for us this week, Brad. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you all uh, next week on another episode of the Tech Pod. Bye. Bye.